What's up? Welcome to Mini Bites. We are on week five. This is our final week for our assurance series going through the book of Romans, Romans chapters 8 through 11. We are on Romans chapter 11. So if you want to turn in your Bibles there, um, we're going to do something a little bit different today for this Mini Bites. We're just going to read the portion of scripture, Romans chapter 11, verses 1 through 24, and we're just going to discuss it. So um, there won't be anything on the screen uh, other than that. So uh, let's let's look at it together. This chapter, chapter 11, is kind of the culmination for this section of what the Apostle Paul has been talking about, and that is really the mystery of God of of his relationship of, of what how he's been dealing with or how he deals with the Jews and the Gentiles and uh, the special relationship that he has with them and how he has pursued both with his glorious gospel. So um, he, he does this with uh, wonderful detail and he also gives a, a new illustration that we're going to go into as well of uh, grafting in new branches. So let's look at Romans chapter 11 together. Romans chapter 11, beginning with verse one. He says, I ask then, did God reject his people? So that's kind of the theme that he continues to talk about. Again, he is uh, supposing that someone is asking him this question. Remember, he has done this over and over again in the book of Romans. He has uh, this kind of invisible uh, question and answer session going on. And he says, has God rejected his people? Because remember, he is writing the book of Romans primarily to Gentiles, but he is also writing to a Roman church that has uh, not just Gentile believers, but also Jewish believers that are coming back in after being ostracized. So they're coming back in and Gentiles are feeling superior and Jews are coming back in saying, what about us? What about all of our beliefs? What about everything that we hold so dear? And so he says, are God's people being rejected, the Jews? And he says, by no means. And then he gives two proofs. The first proof is this one. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. So he, he goes back into his history. He's saying, I'm an Israelite. In fact, I'm from one of the original 12, 12 tribes of Israel. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people. So of the two proofs, the first proof is he himself is an Israelite. So he, the, the, uh, the apostle to the Gentiles, is himself an Israelite, is himself a Jew, a Messianic Jew. So he is saying that his people group, the Jews, are not wholesale um, out of God's plan, that individually they are still, um, the gospel, God's plan is still available to them. But as as a, a nation group, they have turned their back to him. Verse 2, God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know that the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he appealed to God against Israel. Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left, and they are trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee, bowed their knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. If you remember the story, um, he just had on Mount Carmel this, this incredible encounter with the, the prophets of Baal and God answered by fire and he killed 4,000, I believe it was, um, of the prophets of Baal. And he, he had this amazing encounter with the power of God. And then he runs for his life um, because he was uh, going to be to be killed. And, and so he's thinking he's all alone, that he's the only one left 
that is serving God. And God assures him, no, I have a remnant. So the proof number two, first proof is that he himself is an Israelite. He himself is a Jew that God has, has set aside and has a plan for his life. Number two is that there's always been a remnant. Noah was a remnant. Abraham was a remnant. Ezra was a remnant. Nehemiah was a remnant. The list goes on and on and on throughout the Old Testament. Even throughout the New Testament, there's always been a remnant. Going forward, there's always been a remnant. Right now, in, in our present time, there's always been a remnant of God's elect. Notice it says, uh, in the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. Remember, grace didn't just happen when Jesus came onto the scene in the New Testament. There's always been his grace, and they've always been chosen by grace. And those who are chosen by grace are his remnant. There's always been a remnant of people that God has chosen by grace and set aside for himself. Not because they're of a certain nationality, not because of anything that they have done or we have done, but because God has chosen them for himself. Verse 6, and if by grace, then it is no longer by works. Again, nothing we've done, nothing that Noah did, nothing that Abraham did. Remember, Abraham was saved by grace before he was circumcised, before he did anything. It was because he believed. And if by grace, then no longer by works. If it were grace, if it were, grace would no longer be grace. That, that's the definition of grace. Verse 7. What then? What Israel sought so earnestly, it did not obtain. But the elect did. The others were hardened. Uh, we talked about this last week when it talked about Pharaoh's heart being hardened. After Pharaoh had already hardened his heart, I believe it was 10 different times that it says Pharaoh hardened his heart. And then it says that God hardened his heart. And so we see this principle laid out in the book of Romans in Romans chapter one. We won't go into it right now, but that God, his wrath, at least in the present tense, but I believe Going forward as well, the, the true wrath of God is when God gives us over to, to our own intents and purposes of our heart. And so he then just gives us over or gives us over to our uh, hardening of our hearts or go, gives us over to our sins or whatever the case might be. And so likewise, he did that to Pharaoh and, and he did this to his own chosen people, the Jews, the Israelites. Verse 8, as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes so that they could not see, and ears so that they could not hear. To this very day, and David says, may their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see, and their backs be bent forever. Verse 11 is, is a really important verse for this section we're going to be going over today. Verse 11, again, I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? So the first question that he asks in verse 1 is, did God reject his people? And he immediately says, by no means. The second question he asks is in verse 11, did they stumble, the Jews, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? In other words, did did they stumble? Did they reject God and there is no more recovery? They 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 have no more chance to repent. Not at all. He replies right away. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. So in verse eleven, Paul is preparing really his thesis statement that he's going to get to in verse 25 that we're not necessarily going to get to today because we're only going to go to verse 24. We're going to cover verse 25 to the end of the chapter uh, 
in uh, uh, in in part two, which will be on Sunday. Hopefully, you can you can join us for mini bites. Um, but in, in verse twenty five, he basically restates verse eleven and talks about that there was a partial hardening of the uh, Israelites, so that the full measure of the Gentiles would come to salvation, and then all Israel would be saved. And so that's really loaded. What does it mean by all Israel be saved? And so we're going to talk about that on Sunday in part two. Hopefully you can join us. Uh, Verse 12. But if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their fullness bring? Part of them coming back has to do with you and I as Gentiles. I I assume most who are watching this are Gentiles. Part of our responsibility as the Gentiles who have come in is to make the Jewish people who have turned their backs on God jealous. Now, the, the word jealous isn't necessarily necessarily um, sin-inducing. Like, if, if I'm jealous of a co-worker who gets a raise, it's more, I, they should look at my life and see Christ in me and want what I have and see that I have the true Messiah and realize that they have been mistaken and want what I have and want to um, follow me. As, as the Apostle Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. That is to invoke jealousy in the Jews. And that's what Gentiles are called to. And so we see this, this incredible working that, that um, God has for these two people groups, the Israelites and the Gentiles, the rest of humanity at work, that he called his people originally, the Israelites, to be a light for the rest of the world, the Gentiles. And they were at first, and then they kept stumbling and kept falling. And eventually he sent his son to die for the entire world. But then his people group, the Jews, turned their back on him and and said, this isn't the Messiah. And so now they have fallen, and we're going to see that now the the second people group, the rest of humanity, has been grafted in, and now this people group is to reach the rest of the people group, including the Jews, and to make them realize they have been mistaken. And so this is our job. So now he's about to get to this new illustration of being grafted in. Verse 12. But if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their fullness bring? I am talking to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles. I make much of my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. Verse 25, or excuse me, verse 15. Excuse me. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, that what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? So he's saying that his Jewish people are dead and that when they are reconciled to him, it will be like life from the dead. But... It's the same thing as our life. We too were dead. And when we come to Christ, we receive uh, uh, resurrection life. And so we too were once dead and now we are alive. Verse 16. If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. Verse 17. If some of the branches have been broken off and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in, 
among the others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root. Do not boast over those branches. So I'm going to show you a picture of what it looks like for a branch to be broken off and for new branches to be grafted in. Okay, so as you can see, this is what it looks like, at least in, in modern times, a modern picture of what it looks like for a uh, several branches to be grafted into another branch. And the idea is for the branches grafted in to receive nourishing sap, as it says here, from the root. And so he uses this analogy to talk about the wild branches, which would be the Gentiles, were wild in the sense that we were not the original chosen people, the original olive tree or the Gentile, or excuse me, the Jewish people, the Israelites were. And so we were grafted in after they were cut off. Verse 18, he says to the Gentiles, do not boast over those branches. If you do consider this, you do not support the root, but the root supports you. In this analogy and in this context, the root, ultimately we can say that the root is Christ, but, but specifically here, he's talking about the root is the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The root system is that of uh, the chosen people, but, but not the law, not necessarily even Judaism, although we sprang from Judaism, the root is that they were chosen by faith before the law came. So he's saying that not that we were grafted in and so we should start doing new moon festivals and, and start celebrating the Sabbath and all of that and start following the law verbatim. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is that we have been grafted in into God's elect. Verse 19, you will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief, and you stand by faith. So very important that we understand that. The only reason they were broken off was because of unbelief. The only reason we were grafted in is because of faith. They would not have been broken off if they had faith. Likewise, we would not be grafted in if we did not have faith. So do not be arrogant, but be afraid. Again, be afraid is not out of uh, sin. There's uh, do not fear is in scripture, meaning do not be afraid of other things or other people or, or other uh, entities. Uh, be afraid, meaning have reverence for what I'm talking about. Have reverence for how serious God is about this. Verse 21, for if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Meaning this, why were the branches cut off? Because they did not believe. There was unbelief. They were chosen. They were the elect but they were cut off because they un they had unbelief. Likewise, we were grafted in because of faith, but if we have unbelief, if we start unbelieving, if we start not believing, then we also will be cut off. We'll get into more of this on Sunday as well, including this very important passage in verse 22. Consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God, sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And if they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. God can do all things. After all, if you were cut off from an olive tree that is wild by nature and contrary to nature, 
were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? So uh, in part two on Sunday, we're going to talk about what does it mean for all Israel to be saved? What is that? Um, we're going to talk about the kindness and sternness of God, which brings up, does this mean once saved, always saved? Does that bring up that debate? We're going to talk about all of those kind of things. Hopefully you can join us. Yeah.